okay? Yeah. Otherwise, I'll skip the microphone. So rockets go whoosh. <laughs> so you can listen to this part of this video and tell me if you hear a whoosh sound. <laughs> This is one of our rockets being launched uh, from White Sands Missile Range. It's a Terrier Black brand. Our bottom part is a Terrier. The middle. video I'm going to show you, you'll actually hear the whoosh sound that I'm referring to. So let's move on. I have three topics for you today. One will be a little bit about history and where last began with rocket research. A second topic will be about the science that we've done and some of the amazing discoveries that people have made with rockets over the decades. And of course, we've had over 200 rockets from last, so I'll only be able to touch upon a couple of these topics. And a third one is, let's have fun. Let's go on board a rocket and see what it feels like to ride on a rocket. So we have in our last generation of rockets, we have two video cameras with microphones, one looking down, one looking up. So you'd be able to feel like you're in the rocket, experience a rocket ride going into space. Some of you may have seen this before. Uh, I'd also like to thank now Rick Conard and uh, Chris Jefferson for a lot of contributions for several of these slides. So how many of you have worked on a rocket payload at some point? Great. <laughs> and how many people have worked on satellites? <laughs> With the same number of people? Almost <laughs> about the same. <laughs> well, that's one of the themes is a lot of the rocket research has helped develop instruments and lead to new satellite instruments. So you'll see some of that aspect too. Who, who has ever wanted to be an astronaut and go into space? <laughs> has anybody been in space? Is anybody an astronaut here? Have you seen the uh, Gravity movie? Yeah. That's like being in space for two hours. Now, I know there's some inaccuracies in that movie, but if you want to feel like what it feels like to be in space, that's a, a good movie to go see. All right, let's get started. So, how did rocket research begin at last? Well, I'll get to the story of these two, but can anyone point out what these two launch vehicles are? The one on the left? B2. B2. One on the right? Arabi. So these were the two that kind of started research for, for uh, rockets. And of course, it started with the capture of over 300 railroad cars of B2 parts. So uh, there were uh, engines, there were the fuel, there was instruction manuals in German, how to use these, and of course we got uh, von Bonn to come over to the United States and help start you know, rocket research. And he wasn't the only one. Robert Goddard had actually been launching rockets since the 1920s, so rockets been around, but maybe not one for missiles and two for research in this way. So it was really the capture of all these V-2 rockets that the national government decided they would use universities to try to do research with them. One of the contacts was CU here at the physics department uh, with William uh, Pentapole that was the chair of the department at that time. And they asked him, what could you do so that you take a rocket that's spinning, you need to spin up the rockets to be stable. So they do that by canting the fins about a degree and they would spin up as they go, but then how do you use it to observe something? So the idea they had was, well, you build a pointing platform that de-spins, and then you, that's one axis, and the second axis, you tilt out of the nose cone and you look at your target, in this case, the picture of the sun. So this is their concept. And they didn't get funding for another year until 1948. When they did get funding, they became what's called the Upper Air Laboratory, and that's the seed for LASP that was later renamed to be LASP, Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. So here's a group of the 
scientists here getting ready to start this program. They've already built up a prototype model. And it took about two years, but they're getting ready for launch now. And uh, an example of this bi-axle pointing platform is here. This is Rick Conard has this is in his office. So this is half scale, so it's never flown. But basically, the rocket goes up, it's spinning because of the fins. Then this de-spins, and then this axis here comes out and points to the target. So it's the rocket underneath is spinning, but this stays locked up to the target. So this is their invention of how to do research from rockets. So they started building spectrometers and telescopes to put on this. Other interesting thing about this era was they worked outside all the time. You'll see a lot of pictures of them. They're always working outside. Now part of that's because they need to observe things outside like the sun. Part of it is I'm wondering, I don't know if this is true, that the labs weren't tall enough or big enough for rockets and they had to be outside for some of their experiments to just assemble it. I don't, again, I don't know if that's true, but I have suspicion that a lot of these pictures are outside. Here's, they are getting ready for the 1950 first launch for last. Now, uh, the Navy had launched a V-2 rocket in 1947, so we weren't the first to launch a rocket, a research rocket, but we're, this is the first one for last on the Airbnb. Uh, and this is being loaded onto a rail. The way they launched rockets back then was they would have a rail here that would launch off. So there'd be lugs on the rocket that attach to the rail. They would load all the payloads up on the front end of the launch vehicles, put it on a rail here, and, and just tilt it up, like you can see here being hoisted up. And then they get it vertical. They, of course, have a normal functional testing and countdown. It would just launch off the rail, very open. Uh, no structure to support you from weather or whatnot. This was known as the A Tower. Uh, talking to Rick this morning, we think this was started at the Holloman Air Force Base, and then some point they moved the A Tower down to White Sands Missile Range, which is like 50 miles south of Holloman. So there was, Airbees were being launched from Holloman Air Force Base, a little bit north of White Sands, which is down in Mexico, and then there was the White Sands, what's called now Missile Range, but back then it was called the White Sands uh, proving grounds, and that was supported by the Navy. So I think there was some probably some friendly competition between the Navy and the Air Force of how many rockets they could do. Here's an example of the payload after it came back from this first flight. Because the parachute was in the back end, the nose cone part is very crushed. And I've, I've flown about 20 rockets. This is the first nose cone I've ever seen come back. And it doesn't even come back on a parachute. And look how good a shape it is. It has one bit in it. So they must make nose cones better than they did back then because that one got pretty, pretty well crushed. This one came back in, I think it came back in pretty good shape. And now the third rocket was a V-2 rocket. The first two were Air V rockets. And the V-2 was launched from White Sands Proving Ground. And again, it's a bigger, fatter diameter rocket. Uh, and it, but it used a very similar bi-axle pointing platform for it. So it shows them getting that ready for launch. And then as I said, there's probably was friendly or maybe not so friendly competition between the Navy and the Air Force. Now from the, the last point of view, if you thought of this as a football game, the score in the 50s for how many last rockets on V2s was eight. So that's about one a year. Well, in Airbies, the Air Force won. We had 19 launches with the Airbies at Harvard. That's 27 rockets in a decade. That's more than every six months you're launching a rocket. And if that's not amazing, look at the 60s. 79 rockets were launched. That's like every month you're launching a rocket. What happened to those days? Well, Everything was experimental. There was a lot of failures. I, I read someplace that the failure rate was about uh, two-thirds would work and two, one-third did not work, either because experiments or the vehicle itself didn't work. But nonetheless, I still think that's an amazing success rate for something that just began as early research. And if you look at the time 
record of the decades. Of course, there's the early beginning, peaking in the 60s. It looks like it's kind of exponentially decaying to zero, but it really isn't. In the last three years, we've had five rocket launches, so we'll probably exceed the 2000s in this decade, and maybe we're coming back up. Maybe it's a parabola instead of exponentially decaying, who knows, but uh, it definitely is gonna flatten for this next decade. It's also broken up into kind of science categories. We have four divisions at last now. There's the planetary division, there's the space plasma or space physics division, there's a solar influence uh, group, and then the atmospheric group, primarily for Earth's, Earth's atmosphere studies. Uh, a lot of these are solar. A lot of these are atmospherics uh, as well. We actually don't have any plasma rockets. Now we've we, we fly plasma instruments or electric field instruments, but as I looked through the records of 200 rockets and I couldn't find any that mentioned measuring plasma or electric fields for rockets. Part of that is it's really hard to measure electric fields and particles around a rocket. A rocket, one, gets completely charged up and will, of course, repel your particles. And I know there have been experiments for NASA to try to measure particles from rockets, but most of them have been unsuccessful. But they are, if you put the right booms and you put the right technology on it, you can measure those things on rockets. It's just last never has tried. And of course, planetary. We've done several planetary missions using some of the same technology we use for Earth's atmosphere measurements. So I'm going to switch now topics. Before I do, do you have any questions on the history of LASP and rocket research? Okay, time for quiz then. How many, how many were V2s? I would have to look back at that list of 200, but most of those were launched in the 50s, and then we used to extinguish the supply, and they all were airby, so it probably wasn't much more than a dozen. Although, Rick, are you here, Rick? Do you know the answer to that? Uh, I'm here, and I don't know the answer to that. Okay. But, but we have really we have close. a very nice okay. Excel spreadsheet of every rocket yeah. we launch. We can look it up and tell you later, but okay. I would guess it's in the order of a dozen just because they probably by the sixties they probably used them, used them all up. Right. So uh, this uh, this one here, this uh, biaxial system that we uh, Rick, do you know the answer? I think it was yeah. your regular telemetry, radio telemetry, wasn't it? And so, a lot of it was filmed. It was, for, it was filmed. For All of the science data was on film from the solar instruments. So they had to go and recover the film from the spectrum. Did you get one perfect shot then? Yeah, they, they had, back then, of course, almost all detectors was film. So ground-based measurements were as film as well. So they would develop these film uh, reels that would move at either a certain rate or take like a picture at a certain time. So there was electronics to do that. Did they not have any telemetry for any other housekeeping data, Rick, do you know? Or? Uh, for the vehicle systems they did, they had FM, FM transmitters that had tubes in it. And so they would get some telemetry from that. But uh, all of the science data, they didn't have, they didn't have electronic detectors for the, for the solar instruments. They were all film spectrographs. So here's, here's your quiz. There's, NASA has studied and you know, every decade they have to make recommendations for what they do the next decade. So their decadal surveys, and the last one they did for solar orbital rockets, uh, they had five recommendations or motivations of why you should do rockets. I'm asking you, the audience, to tell me those top five reasons. That's true, but that actually wasn't one of the top five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Technology demo is number three. Okay. Measure atmospheric changes. Measure atmospheric changes. Uh, that's true. I would put that in science. Let's call it measurement of science. So just what are the science you're trying to do? That's number one. Okay. Three more frequency. to go. Frequency and launch them 
bring things back to them, launch them again a lot quicker. Yes, and they classify that as special targets of opportunities. Like there's a new comment, you need to go quickly to look at this new comment. So yes, they can launch a rocket quickly. So that's number two. Okay, two more. Education. 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 That's number five. Train the next generation. Okay, one left. One that I do all the time. Calibration. Calibration of satellite instruments. That's number four. In fact, most of my rocket flights have been for calibration of other rock or other satellite instruments. So here they are. And I'll touch base on some of these results in the next few slides. Now, first of all, to kind of, why do we launch rockets for research? Well, I think most of you that have been at LASP or associated with any kind of research for uh, LASP is that we observe a lot of our science in the ultraviolet wavelength spectrum. This is a plot of wavelength in nanometers, so this starts the uh, middle ultraviolet, uh, I mean near ultraviolet, far ultraviolet, and extreme ultraviolet, and this is where approximately the solar photons are absorbed in Earth's atmosphere. And you can see most of the radiation can reach the ground above about 320 nanometers. That's the blue part of the spectrum. Uh, but as you go shorter wavelengths, they get absorbed in different layers of the atmosphere. There's of course the troposphere we live in, the stratosphere where the ozone is, the mesosphere which is the coldest region in this atmosphere, and then the thermosphere. And these are the primary absorbers. Uh, ozone for this wavelength range, electro-oxygen for this middle range, and then molecular oxygen and atomic oxygen at the extreme ultraviolet. And the importance of this is this is energy for our atmosphere, the UV radiation. But because it's absorbed in the atmosphere, we have to get above the atmosphere to observe it. So there's all sorts of interesting science that we do with this. Down low, ozone is destroyed with some solar photons, and different photons are creating ozone. So you end up with the peak of ozone in this region, as well as an increase in temperature. This is the plot of temperature in the atmosphere as you go higher up in the atmosphere. So this is heating by solar absorption of ozone and creation of ozone. Then it gets cold. This is the coldest place in the Earth's atmosphere is the mesopause here. And then all this EUV radiation goes in and dissociates and ionizes, making plasma in our atmosphere, the ionospheres in this range as well as the thermosphere. So the physics of this, of course, was not really understood fully until we started launching rockets and actually measured these UV photons and measured the structure in the atmosphere. There was theories of what it might be back in in the 1920s, 1930s, but a lot of this science, every rocket was a new discovery. And one of these great discoveries early on, it was here at, uh, at CU with Bill Rentz, was the measurement of the solar Lyman Alpha emission. This is a far to value emission that's very, very bright. Uh, this is one of their rockets they're launching uh, in 1952. Here's the spectrum on photographic film. And I'll show you another spectrum more modern. This is the very bright line that pretty much saturated the film. And that's the very, very bright Lyman Alpha emission. There's other uh, solar lines here as well. And the importance of this is that it's about a thousand times brighter than all the other emission lines. And also, they didn't really understand that there were a lot of emission lines in the solar spectrum. Again, this is a spectrum in wavelength and nanometers. This is the intensity, the brightness, the radiance. As you go from the visible down to UV wavelengths, they knew about things down to 320 because you can measure that on the ground, and they knew about these uh, dark regions that were called Fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum all throughout the visible. But they didn't realize that it transitioned over to lots of bright emission lines. And the brightest one is the Lyman Alpha emission. So it's very important for our Earth's atmosphere for both uh, photos chemistry of nitrogen oxide and uh, mesosphere ozone, as well as creating the ionosphere of heat region. And LASP has a long history of this. We're, we're sort of the international provider of Lyman Alpha irradiance measurements. We have a long series of measurements, not only in rockets starting in the 1950s, but SME, URs, 
time, source, and now we have SDO Eve up and running and future measurements from the GOAST's operational satellites providing this Lyman Alpha series. Now this is a composite where we combined uh, a lot of different measurements. We've also, where we didn't have continuous measurements, uh, we calibrated with a proxy. This case is a 10.7 centimeter radio proxy that's measured on the ground. So we have the Lyman Alpha record for the world. And we update that daily. You can go to the website and get it, get it every day. So that's one of the major discoveries. Now let's have a little fun. So during this time period, of course, a lot of interest in space. Uh, and laughs got a lot of recognition. They had things like Smithsonian display showing some of their early sounding rockets, the bikes, the pointing platform, some of the measurements. This is a Washington Post front page article about measuring the x-rays of the sun. What do you see in that sun? It looks like a happy face or smiling. And I can't help but think, did it make the news because front page because it didn't look like anything they expected? Is this like a joke? Is this did somebody just draw this or something? I mean obviously you can see you can see the sunglasses, the smiley. And the reason why I think this is so funny is we launched SDO. And guess what we saw? <laughs> what? What? What is the sun doing? Now, in this case, we have a lot better resolution. We can tell what the features are better. These are active regions. These are uh, filament across a neutral line of this, the active regions here. But it, it's very candidly similar. So that's not a great discovery. <laughs> Here's another great discovery. So we didn't know what the upper atmosphere was, both planets and our own Earth, which is a planet. And at, at last, Charles Barth came from JPL in 1965 and started launching a lot of rockets as well as missions to Mars, the Mariner 6 and 7, for example. And of course, they discovered all sorts of UV emissions uh, from Earth's atmosphere as well as other planet, mostly Venus and Mars were studied with rockets at the time. And of course, the importance of this is telling you what the composition of the atmosphere is very accurately, and also based on the width of these lines and temperature as a function of altitude if you did limb scans and whatnot of the planet. So this was one of the other uh, major early discoveries from rockets in the 50s and 60s. Here's a picture of Charles and the rocket team that White Sands as a younger Barth. Uh, if anybody's been to White Sands, can you figure out which building this is? Okay, Rick, you can tell. I think it's the BAB. Yeah, it's the BAB. You can tell because of the high ceiling. Uh, I can almost recognize those rafters too, but but we still use this building today. Uh, it's, it's been renovated as an excellent new facility. It it's, uh, surpasses anything they've had before. They've got really nice clean rooms. Everything back then, of course, was integrated in air. Things were not uh, kept clean. They didn't know about keeping things clean. They, of course, there were a lot of hard lessons learned with some of the early rockets. Uh, so, and a lot of times the rockets survived just fine, but when they started flying those same instruments on satellites, there was two key things that was hard lessons to learn. One was contaminants. Uh, I forgot to point it out, but one of those pictures of them working outside, there's a guy smoking a cigarette about 20 feet away from the payload. So they had no concept of contaminants <laughs> back then. Uh, the other one is radiation hardening for particle effects in space to damage our electronics. So early satellite missions often lasted weeks, a few months at most, mainly because of radiation damage or contamination to optics. So all those lessons were learned the hard way in the, the 70s when we started launching a lot of satellites. By the 80s, most of that was figured out. And now we have satellites that can last 10, even 20 years. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, one of the motivation for a lot of what we do for rockets now is developing the technology to go build satellites or missions and our next mission to Mars is uh, MAVEN mission, which is launching here 
it lasts in two weeks, November 18th, with our Bruce Tukoski as a PI for that program. We have, I don't know, we can call it two and a half instruments on board, Maven. Uh, so we're looking forward to that launch and going back to Mars. Another great discovery was re related to uh, corona hole measurement on the sun. Uh, actually, I forgot to paste in a good picture of corona hole. Well, corona hole, if you look in like the x-ray picture of the sun, it's the dark region on the sun. It looks like a hole, but it moves around very quickly. And back in the 70s and 80s, they were trying to figure out why do these holes exist and why do they change so rapidly? And there was a big argument about is particles flowing into the corona holes or particles flowing out of the corona holes? And it's one of Gary Rodman's rocket flight that answered that. And this may be a hard plot to understand, but I'll give you the interpretation. This is wavelength, basically, it's a function of pixel on the sun. And basically, it comes along, and the dips are a blue shift, meaning things are flowing out of the rocket. So this was a huge discovery. Now we know the corona holes is the source of the sol slow solar winds from the sun. But back then, it wasn't known. And at one of the big SOHO meetings, uh, Mark Huber, who was like the project scientist who started SOHO, said that this paper and this discovery by Gary was one of the primary motivations of having this uh, very large international SOHO mission. As I mentioned also, target of opportunities, uh, Comet Halley was one of those comets that of course comes around every 76 years. Uh, we flew several rockets. At the time, I was at Johns Hopkins University, and we flew a sounding rocket with Paul Feldman to, to look at Comet Halley twice, one only uh, two weeks apart before it went behind the sun and after it came around the sun. And that's kind of where my part of my rocket career started was back there at Hopkins. But here at last, the rocket program at this time period in the 80s had converted from being rockets, like I showed you, to being actual payloads on space shuttle called Spartan programs. And all the rocket PIs were switching to this opportunity to go fly on the space shuttle. And this is the uh, box here, kind of the size of a Spartan, about a meter by a meter by a meter, so about a meter cube kind of size. They would pick it up by the grappling arm here, throw it off the shuttle, and a week later pick it back up and bring it back down. So it's like the super rocket. You get a whole week of data instead of 10 minutes of data. So uh, there was about, uh, I think, nine Spartan programs going on during the 80s, and most of the rocket PIs at the time were switching to that because it's going to give you so much more data. Of course, most of you probably recognize this did not end well for the Challenger. Here's some good characters here of, that were in the Challenger inspecting things before being launched. There's Rick, who's sitting in the back there. And Alan Stern, I don't know if you recognize him. And of course, as I mentioned, it was a sad day, tragic day for the Challenger. They lost the astronauts. Of course, they lost the Spartan Halley experiment. And it was that point in history that they decided to go back to rockets. It took them about a year to recognize that there's too much risk and the delay to get on the shuttle was so long. They did end up launching two successful Spartans to uh, combination of HAO here in town with Goddard to do a solar mission. They launched it twice. I think those were the only Spartans ever flown, at least for NASA. I think there were some Air Force uh, defense type Spartans flown, but not, not NASA. So rockets came back in the in full force. They got rid of the Spartan program. They moved the rocket program to Wallops instead of Goddard and Greenbelt. And one of the other aspects of rockets is the technology, testing new technology. So uh, example, a great example from LASP and working with the physics department, this is Scott Robertson here, started a dust detector uh, development program, Mihai Arani from physics department and then later adding Zoltan and many others. We now have a very robust rocket, or not rocket, dust uh, measurement program to study dust in our atmosphere and within our solar system got a black cloud dust detector going view horizon. Here's a launch from Norway. They launched this twice. Beautiful picture. I think. Did you take this picture, Rick, or was this one that you just got from the range? Uh, 
I did not take the picture. It was somebody that was watching the launch. Right. Spectacular picture. You can tell it's time lapsed. There's the uh, first stage and the second stage, it looks like, going off. And then, of course, the one that we're really excited about right now is the LDEX that's been aboard the LADI mission that launched in September. It's now orbiting the moon. It will be there for another 100 or so days to study. Uh, and the orbit will decrease in altitude. I'm not exactly sure how fast it's going to decrease in altitude, but eventually, you know, like 100 days, it's going to uh, have its own landing party. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be more of a crash than a landing. But anyway, they're measuring dust on the moon right now. Another technology that we're doing that's also sort of under the solar orbital program is balloon flights. So these are high altitude balloons that they launch and they can stay up for uh, several hours. And if you launch them from Antarctica, they can stay up for, for several weeks because they can just get in a bright pattern and they can just circle Antarctica. But in this case, this is flown from uh, New Mexico uh, and I guess near the Texas border. And this is just flown last month. And this is experiment for hyperspectral imaging of Earth, but it also looks at the sun for calibration. So this is a new technology for LASP and a new way of calibrating Earth observing instruments for climate studies. And of course, we want to put this on satellite. So we're writing proposals. Now that we've got a great successful balloon flight, we hope that our future proposals for these will be successful for satellite measurements. Here's an example of it lifting off. They have to fill the balloons early in the morning because it takes so long to fill it. So this is why you're watching the sunrise here. And then this is the during the daytime when they actually release it. Here's an example solar spectrum uh, measure from that. He, Greg provided me more, more images from this first flight. They all look great, but like the time, I'm not going to show them all. But, but it worked, and we're excited to, to have another flight in uh, about a year. So now, um, the other topic I mentioned, last calibration rocket. So we've been doing this uh, for almost 30 years. It started with s &E, Solar Mesospheric Explorer. And it, even though most of the instruments on s &E looked down at the ground and studied Earth's atmosphere, it also had a solar instrument to study the driver for a lot of these uh, reactions in the atmosphere. So this solar instrument, of course, was degrading with time. So I had a calibration rocket uh, approximately every year. They had five of them total. Uh, Gary Rothman was the PI for the rocket, as well as Bill McClintock, many of you probably know Bill. And another scientist you may not know, George Mountain, is left last. He's up at Washington State now. But those three people kind of ran this rocket program for several years. And that's where I actually met Gary and Bill, was at one of the calibrations at the NIST facility in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We calibrate our instruments at the synchrotron ultraviolet radiation facility there. That's where I met them and got interested in their programs and eventually came out here myself in 87. And not long after arriving, I helped with a calibration rocket. To, there was a San Marcos satellite. It's an Italian satellite that the Goddard helped support. And they only had an 11-month mission. It was a low-altitude uh, orbit, so it wasn't going to stay in Earth's orbit very long. And they didn't have a calibration for their solar instrument. So they asked us in, in late August of 88, could you fly a calibration rocket for us? You do so many calibration rockets. We said, sure. And then we thought about it and thought, but you're working in the extreme ultraviolet, and everything we've done is in the far ultraviolet. We don't even have anything like that. So we were go-getters. He built a new EUV instrument, calibrated it, sir, and flew it in 65 days. And here's a picture of those young whoopers. <laughs> Greg's here. I don't know if Greg's here or not, but Greg's still here with us myself. And this, I think, was Jeff Block, who was like the uh, mission manager for Wallace. And one of those, of course, interesting things, you do this heroic act of doing this great calibration, and NASA gives out an award, but they give it to Wallace. So they don't even tell us for two years that there's an award for <laughs> this calibration. Now, our latest series is uh, for the TIME program, which is still operating, but it's been superseded by a better measurement from the uh, extreme ultraviolet experiment E that launched in 2010. So we now have calibration flights for STO. Uh, here's an example of STO being launched. 
So this is a launch on Atlas V back in 2010. That's also what the Maven launch is on, I think from the same launch rail at Kennedy. Who, who's going after the Maven launch? So you saw SDO as well. So the one thing difference you'll notice, and I think Chris knows this, is as you saw those rocket launches that I showed you at the very beginning, they're very fast. They're coming, they come off the rail in a fraction of a second. You go watch one of these big rockets, the Atlas V, and you swear they're not going to leave the rail. You need to all run out there and push it up, but it does finally push it. So here's our last rocket flight for STO. It was just a couple weeks ago, October 21st, and that's where that nose cone is from. It was a very successful flight with our measurements in the extreme ultraviolet. This is an example, a quick look image of the CCD detectors that measure the spectrum. So instead of film now, we use CCD detectors. And our final part of the evening is let's go for a ride on the rocket. Now, this is the rocket that we launched uh, in a couple weeks ago. We had about 40 visitors from mostly labs that came out, and the day before, many of them came out to view the launch site and see the launch facilities. I'm not going to name off everybody, but anybody here in the audience that was here at this picture? Did you have fun? <laughs> yes. Yeah, working on rockets can be fun. It can be very rewarding. It can be very long hours too, but uh, we, we, watching the launch and watching the data come back is wonderful. So when we provide a rocket payload, we only provide the scientific instruments. NASA and their contractor, NESROC, provides all the other subsystems, and I'll talk about that briefly here. So here's a, a schematic of our rocket payload that we flew. <coughs> Starting from left to right, there's the Orsa. It's called a thousand pound, meaning it's the parachute can hold a thousand pounds when it comes back down. We actually launched a 1,200 pound parachute. This is labeled incorrectly. Our payload weighs about a thousand pounds when it comes back. And because we put a bigger parachute, it comes back with a pretty soft landing. The Orsa adapter is just a ring to kind of interface it. And then there's the Sparks. Uh, attitude control system, which has gas jets to control the rocket. It has magnetometers, it has solar sensors, it has uh, ring gyros. It points the sun, it points the rocket to the sun with about 0.1 arc second precision. Amazing ACS. Most satellites don't even do that. Uh, there's a guided system that only runs for a few seconds. This is so that if there's any ground winds, that it doesn't impact where we end up landing. So that's a very critical part that they added, started adding in the 90s so that they can launch on time more frequently. There's the telemetry section. It has all these antenna bands that radiates uh, the signals down to the ground. So all our data is real time. We grab all the data telemetry. We have three different telemetry frequencies. One is for housekeeping data, one is for our science data, and one is for our video cameras that you'll see the, camera, the video from. Then there's three instrument sections. We taper from the 17 inch diameter to 22 inch so we can have a bigger payload. So we have control electronics, we have uh, this set solar section, which is where we have six instruments, uh, is under vacuum when we launch. There's a shutter door that opens we take our measurements, the shutter door closes, so we also land under vacuum. So we keep all our instruments extremely clean throughout the flight. So there's, in this other section, there's parts of this uh, payload to pump out the section, keep the detectors cold. We, we run a cryo cooler to keep the detectors at about minus 60 degrees Celsius. And then we have, of course, a separation system that we separate from the black branch motor, which we go to the right, and then there's a terrier motor that goes even more to the right. <laughs> so just a little bit more specific on some of the timeline that you're going to see. So the video cameras are inside the rocket. What will happen as a time flight, you'll start off, of course, at the ground. You'll go up. The Terrier motor will fall off. The Black Brant motor will fall off. And we're spinning at about four revolutions per second. So we're spinning pretty fast. You'll see that in the video. Hopefully you don't get sick. Where's the trash can? And then 
it despins, and then the ACS system, the spark system, takes over and takes the payload, which the solar instruments are pointing down, and slews them up and look at the sun. And then we start our about uh, eight minutes of observations of the sun. That's our science part of the mission. So we're kind of in a fixed uh, position the whole time. And then we come back down, we hit the atmosphere, they spin up the payload on purpose so that you can more uniformly distribute the heating of re-entry, and then it tumbles, and then the parachute opens, and it drifts back down and lands on the ground. And then we, a few people get in helicopters, fly out, pick up the payload, and come back the same day. So it all happens in a period of about three hours, although we have to start about six hours before launch, so it's a very long day. But that's kind of what you're going to see, but from the inside of the rocket. So the altitude is about 280 kilometers, and uh, downrange is about 80 kilometers. Now, this is a simulation of what the flight is, and Chris Jefferson sitting here has done some wonderful videos for us. One of them was what this looks like as a function of time. So you can go to the website here and load his flight simulation movie. I'm not going to show it for a flight of time. What I'm going to show you is there's two videos that are looking down out of the rocket. So this is our payload that we provide. So we have these six solar instruments that when we launch are looking down toward the ground. We have a, a control section to hold electronics and support of uh, vacuum hardware. And inside here are two aspect cameras. One points down, that's this camera, and one points up, kind of candid relative to each other, about a 70 degree field of view. And Chris has smartly put these approximately the distance apart. There's a gap between the two cameras. They don't overlap in images, but as you see as the Earth is rotating, they do fairly well lined up. They kind of continue as kind of, kind of view. Uh, and the things to watch for, there's, the, of course, this is the aft camera looking down, forward camera looking up at launch time. Now, of course, doing launch, we slew up and look at the sun, so this is the one that will be looking toward the sun, this is looking uh, toward the ground. So meters to watch, this is time since launch, so seconds or minutes, seconds since launch. So these times up here correspond to that. So at one minute, 16 seconds, we despin the rocket, so the rocket's spinning really fast. And of course, they could use up a lot of ACS gas to slow down the spinning, but instead they have this clever yo-yo technique. They basically put little masses on the rocket with about I don't know, 30 feet of cable, and they just release those. It's like a big two yo-yos come out, and that pretty much slows down the spinning to almost nothing. And then the gas jets come in and correct it completely. So this is time since launch. That's one of the first events. This is the about that time. There's a separation of the black branch, and they have these B bands that hold things together. And there's a little, uh, basically, like a 22 shot shell that cuts piece of metal or screw and releases for V-band. So this is how the nose cone is released and how the black brand is released. And there's these two little V-bands. They look this looks like a, a cartoon bird there. The other thing you'll notice is the black brand fins are right there. And you'll also see the exhaust from that in the launch. Here's we launch at White Sands Missile Range. There's also a national monument which has a lot of white sands. The gypsum sand, that's the White Sands National Monument area. So you'll see that a lot in the video. And then looking forward is the S-19 canards, the little fins right here. And doing the video, one of them falls off. It's not designed to survive coming down. And they, of course, need to work going up. But you'll see one of these, uh, this fin here, fall off. They're made out of magnesium, so that's very flammable. You'll see it catch on fire and be smoking all over. So it's very fast, you have to watch for it. Uh, and then, of course, later, it takes about 10 minutes to get through this. Uh, the drew sh chute opens and the parachute opens, and then, of course, we have landing. Now, Chris compressed all this about 30 minutes of video into four minutes. So what you'll see is the interesting part and the stuff happening really fast running at real time. Then we get to the slow part of the where the video looks the same that is we're doing our eight minutes of observation he speeds that up I believe a factor of 10 is that right Chris? so that the clock will start moving really fast uh, the other interesting thing about this video because we have microphones on this uh, of 
course, you'll hear some sounds, but don't you need air to have sound? What you hear is a lot of metal frequencies. Ping, bong, and all sorts of noises during the rocket flight. As these things like the V-Man uh, get shot off, you hear like metal ringing. And they had this in the Gravity movie too, where you kept hearing this ping, bong. Oh, that's real. This is what you hear in the rocket flight, even though there's no air. And also listen for the wish sound. You'll hear a lot of noise, and then it gets really quiet. But in that transition from being really loud to no sound, that is being in vacuum, uh, the air is rushing out of these skins as fast as they can. And that's the wishing sound that I think about this one. So you can listen to that. OK. Is that enough explaining? We, we have enough time to watch it twice. So maybe, depending if you want to see it or not, you can let me know. Again, this is the aft camera looking down at launch. This is looking up. There's the guard with the S-19. Uh, and I'm having trouble seeing them, but right there are the black so rays. Behind the styrofoam. Ah, so you can't see them. Okay. You all ready? You can count down with the clock, too, if you want. <laughs> up to look at the sun. I believe that's the V-band from the nose cone still floating out there, but I'm not positive what that is. And this is where we speed up. Clock going much faster. The other thing that Chris had on this flight was a telemeter to measure the, the G factors on the rocket as well as velocity and stuff. And I don't know if this is from the radar data or from his accelerometer. That's from the accelerometer. So that's, that's amazing that worked. And this is a profile of altitude where we are in the orbit. So now we're approaching apogee. Uh, we're making all these great measurements. We're very excited. We can finally breathe. We've gotten measurements. And now we're starting to come back down. So here, when this reaches about eight minutes, we'll start spinning up for re-entry. We start seeing the, the limb of Earth going up. This is looking over the Pacific Ocean, California. Spinning up now. When you're getting anti-wishing, you're getting air flowing back into the payload. So this camera will show you where we're going to land. You'll first see a shadow of the chute in the payload in the video. And then the parachute 
drags us a little bit more for the parachute settles back there. So you want to see it again? Yes, no? Yes. Yes. Four minutes. <laughs> this time and let everyone stare at things they want to watch. I see something different every time I watch this. I like to see. the shutter door that opens. And a little bit of history of why we have a camera. So Rip Conner I think wanted to see what it looked like from space. So he flew a camera, a still camera, on a BART rocket. He was so excited about that. And we got ready for one of my rockets. He said, you know, we really need a video camera. And I said, well, I don't know if I can justify that. He says, yeah, you need to know the roll angle of your air glow instrument so you know where the Earth's limb is. And I said, okay, that's good enough. Excuse me. <laughs> We've been flying a rocket with video cameras ever since. And uh, they've gotten better every time. Uh, we. Before last year, we had a lot of speckle because the CCDs heated up. This time, uh, Blake Veneer and Rick put a strap on the CCD camera, so thermal strap, and they don't have a speckle like they had before. So this is our best, best video ever. And these are like $600 cameras. These are not speckle cameras. These are things. These little helmet cams you put on your helmet to ride around a bicycle and see the world. That's all this is. I just have one conclusion slide. So we do have some more flights planned. We have one more to you know, the prime mission of STO maybe every two years after that. We have another high six balloon flight in fall 2014. Then we have five pending proposals under the rocket program. One is a rocket experiment with Lynn Harvey. One is a balloon experiment with Mark Rest and PI. And then three CubeSat missions. You say CubeSat, that doesn't sound like a so cool. Well, that's going in orbit, but that's where CubeSats fit within NASA. We did have an NSL CubeSat launched in last year. It's been extremely successful. And, and many of us are hoping that CubeSats are the future for tiny rocket programs. Just like Spartans at one point was going to be the future for rocket programs, we're thinking CubeSats have a place within NASA under this program. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>